Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eduard Ramon, and we are going to do the, the class of uh, 3D reconstruction. So these are uh, uh, three, uh, two lectures in one, let's say. We will do them uh, in a row, so it's going to be about uh, 50 minutes, something like that, okay? So yeah, I'm uh, working in 3D reconstruction algorithms using deep learning. I work at Chrysalix Labs, which is this company up here. And I'm also doing a PhD here in the UPC about the same topic. OK, so the talk is going to be as follows. Uh, we're going to make a very fast introduction. And then we're going to talk about three kinds of representation to work with uh, 3D and deep learning. There are more, but uh, we cannot uh, cover all of them. So I think those ones are quite useful. Uh, I think are better to cover. And then we will draw some conclusions. OK, so the motivation is basically that uh, 3D is useful for many, many kind of fields. We can see it in autonomous driving, 3D printing, robotics. And basically, it's important also for intelligence, because it's not, it's not uh, only necessary to see in an image that there is a dog or there is something else. But where, where is this dog? How I can plan ahead and go to it or escape from it? So it's a very important part from, from the intelligence, at least as how we as humans understand it. So we should start by this question. You, I know you already had the class with, with Javi, right? But what's 3D? If I show you this, maybe you would say it's 3D. You would say it's not 3D. How many of you would say this is 3D? Could be 3D. Yeah? Some of you? No? OK. If I make you choose between the two, you would say the one on the right, maybe, or the one on the left? The one on the right? Both are 3D. Actually, they both represent three dimensions because this is grayscale, and we could represent 3D using that image. But maybe we, with that image, we could only represent surfaces. We cannot represent volumes. And with the other one, we could represent anything we want. That's the difference between domain and signal. In that one, the domain is 2D, and the signal that is flowing on top is 1D. And the other one, the domain is 3D, and we are having just, well, could be anything that point, could be a n-dimensional signal. So OK, it's just uh, that in 3D, the representation matters a lot. You, the first thing you need to understand here when you are approaching a, a problem that is related with 3D is to think about which data representation fits better for you for that problem. Otherwise, you will struggle a lot. A lot. So that's the first thing to, to think about. So yeah, with that example, maybe we can connect with depth maps. Depth maps are just images that at each dimension, we have a depth value. So we have x, y, and we just need the z, right? So it's very simple. And since we are very used to work with images in deep learning, all the operations that we know for images can be applied to depth maps, all of them, even more. So yeah, basically this, we assign uh, a depth to each pixel. Each pixel is a 3D point. And all the standard image operations can be, can be used. Uh, the problem with that, we, all, we can only represent surfaces. Unless we integrate many of them with just one depth map, we only have a surface. Because I'm saying, from this point, you go here, but I cannot go beyond that. I just can go to a certain depth point. OK. Uh, recently, in the maybe past 10 years already, since uh, we got uh, the Kinex sensor, it's quite cheap to acquire these, these signals. And yeah. The thing is that they are noisy, but anyway, we can work with them. And they are useful for many, many applications. Uh, we see them on rendering, on graphics, on uh, slam systems. 3 d reconstruction is just everywhere. It's a very, very useful representation for, um, for many applications. So if I, if I ask you uh, how would you generate depth maps, maybe the first kind of architecture you would think about is this kind of encoder, decoder, like, or UNET architecture. So from an image, I want to predict the depth, right? So I have this architecture with maybe skip connection and so on to pro uh, propagate the structure from the original image. And then if I'm lucky and I have some ground truth, I could just create a very fancy loss. Maybe the MSG is the simplest one. But what happens if I don't have the, the, the depth? Because in some applications, it's not possible. There are many reasons. 
uh, well, to begin with, is that they are much scarce than, than normal RGB images. Sometimes it's hard to uh, acquire them. Maybe not with Kinect, but imagine you want to uh, obtain death maps from the street. You need to drive with a car through it, maybe with a lighter or something else. Uh, yeah, so expensive setups. Uh, you need to have very well calibrated uh, things to have aligned image and depth. And so if humans are capable of more or less estimating depth, why not the machines, right? So it's an intuition that maybe uh, can make us think that we can do it with machine learning as well. So we're going to talk about this paper in concrete because the supervised setup is more or less straightforward. So I would like to talk, with, uh, to talk about this work. And basically, what they do is to learn to predict death from videos in an unsupervised way. They don't have any ground truth, OK? And the idea is that they get a target frame for the one they want to predict death. And then, then they make use of the neighbor frames to create a supervision signal, OK? To create an error, let's say. And with that, they backprop this error and try to minimize it. <coughs> We're going to see how they do that. So. Imagine the architecture that we uh, showed before, encoder, decoder, we predict death. That's the basic approach. I have ground truth death, OK. But what happens if I don't have this? In this paper, what they propose is to use the nearby views and to predict two auxiliary signals, which is the relative pose, which is uh, this, what, this P here between T and S. T is a target, and S, I don't know if it's source or ne anyway, it's a, the nearby view, OK? It's the one that brings to the other one. And then they have this explainability mass that later on I will explain why they do that. So with this, they are able to synthesize the target view. They are ev able to recreate, actually, the input signal. And then they can create the loss very, simple, the, very simply. Because this, here, this equation here means this is the target uh, view, and this one is the synthesized one. So it's just the error between both. And then they have this explainability mask. This explainability mask is because sometimes there are occlusions. So if I have a neighbor frame, maybe I see, it, I see an object in one and I don't see it in the other. So it's impossible to, that I can synthesize something that is not viewed in the, in the other one. Or maybe there is something that is moving non-rigidly. So I cannot uh, predict with that model that object either. Okay. So yeah, uh, taking a closer look to the loss. Basically, the synthesized view is a function of the nearby view, the depth that I have predicted, and the relative pose. I'm not using the explainability mask to generate this view. Okay? It's just used to uh, ponder the, the error. And the good news is that f is differentiable. If we use multi-view geometry, we can recreate this uh, function in a differentiable way, so we can backpropagate the errors. And I'm going to do a very, very fast parenthesis about multi-view geometry. So we can understand how this uh, f function is, is created, OK? So normally, the, we are using multi-view geometry to uh, explain mathematically how the points travel from 3D to 2D, OK? So imagine I have this point here. This is an image. So there is normally a straight line that goes from one point to the other. And depending on the camera model that we use, because there are many camera models, we will travel in one way or another. I'm going to explain just one model. But there are many, OK? This could be more or less what is happening. So we have this F and C, which are the focal length and the camera center, the optical center, it's also called. And with these parameters, I can compute the slope, actually, this uh, slope, this line that is projecting into the image plane. Yeah, here you have more or less list what, what could be the elements, OK? We would have a sensor, which determines also the image plane. We have the focal length, the optical center, and so on. So if we analyze a bit more this uh, graph, doing very simple math, computing the slope, we can see that the y, the, the capital Y, divided by, by z uh, capital as well, is the same as the y in minus divided by f. Okay? So here we already have the relation. We have the, the position in the image, which is the y minus. It's just the focal length multiplied by the y. Uh, minus, uh, capital, sorry, divided by the z. So we already have the connection between 2D and 3D, right? And normally, we add the optical center, which is, is this CY. Because if you remember, the origin uh, in an image is in the top corner. If we don't add this, we would have it in the center. It's just a matter of uh, coordinates. We can do the same for x. 
okay? And if you look at this equation on the, oh, if, if you look at these equations here, they can be expressed as one and two, okay? It's just that they can be expressed in a, in a um, matricial way, let's say. And as you can see, this is differentiable. It's just a product of, of matrices, which is differentiable. So no, no uh, any kind of source area to go from 3D to 2D. It's going to happen the same, right? Yes, thank you. OK, that's the first thing. Then second thing. This projection works if the camera is centered at the origin. OK, it's not going to work if I have the camera at some point of the space. I cannot project from 3 to uh, 2 d directly. So what happens if we have this setup, right? Imagine that this camera is rotated at, uh, in some angles and placed at t in some point of the space. So what I can do is just to invert this pose, but also to invert the point. So I have the same scene, but placed somewhere else. Now the camera is in the center, and I can uh, multiply by k. Okay? So that's how we project a point that is somewhere in 3D, and my camera is somewhere as well. Cool. So with that, let's think about the problem that we have. Okay, I have the nerve eye view, I have the depth, and I have the camera pose. And for each coordinate of my synthesized view, I want to find a value, an uh, RGV value, from the nerve eye view that I want to fill there. Okay? It's just I'm going to pick pixels from the nerve eye view, and I will put it on the coordinates of the synth synthetic view. Yeah? OK. So this could be the example. I have these coordinates, R and C, that I don't know which pixel to put, this interrogation signal. So the first thing I can do is to project this point from 2D to 3D. We explained the, the, the other operation, 3D to 2D, but we can invert it, and we can go from 2D to 3D, OK? With the relative camera pose, I can put the point in the coordinate system, let's say, of the nearby view, because I have predicted it. And now, since we know how to project, we can just go to the nearby view. With, that, with everything that we predicted, we can go to the position of the nearby view. And now we just simply pick the point, we access to the image, and we say, OK, for this R and C, we pick the pixel, and we fill it in the synthesized view. It's as simple as that. We just close this uh, let's say, uh, way until we find an array view. So these are some results, OK? This is just learned from video with any supervision. From that input image, we are generating this depth map. It's not super accurate, but it's quite impressive that with any supervision, we can achieve that. And these are the results of the explainability mass they obtain, which are quite sensible because we are seeing, for example, just uh, people walking, uh, pedestrians. Uh, so these are not subject to rigid um, movements. And this is something our model we uh, cannot explain. So the explainability mask is saying, don't take that into account in the loss because it's not helpful for me to minimize the error. Okay? We are seeing motorcycles, more people. Here we are seeing some plants moving, that maybe because there is wind on the last row. You're seeing it. And yeah, that's, that's the, first, uh, the first paper. And there are some observations. Uh, you, can, you can read them at, at home. But essentially, is that uh, synthesizing views, novel views, it's super useful for uh, doing self-supervision. Okay? So if you don't have data, maybe you can think about how would you synthesize the input, and then you can just uh, compute the loss. Yeah, and this planability mask is a trick, but it can be used for other tasks. For example, if you are using image segmentation on videos, for example, you will have the same kind of occlusions probably, and you can use this kind of this kind of signals. Great. So we're going to talk now a com about a completely different type of 3D representation, which are the morphable models. Okay, the morphable models are just linear models which are controlled by some coefficients. In this case, is the red alpha. So imagine I have a shape in 3D. So I have the point 0.1, the point 0.2, the point 0.3. All these points, if I draw them in 3D, they are this shape, maybe a face. And imagine, let's say that this shape is the mean. If I add some other shapes on top with different, for example, a fat one, a thin one, and so on, and I control them with a slider maybe, or with an alpha parameter, I can generate novel faces, OK? So that's the, that's the main idea of linear models or 3D morphological models. 
Great. How do I obtain that mean and those bases? So essentially, I need data. Okay? Not as much to train a deep learning model, but I need some data. Maybe for that case, you could do it, you could do it with 200 cases, something like that. Okay? So it's not thousands and thousands. Okay, how we generate that? So the procedure is to, if I have different shapes, I just need to put them on a row vector, which is this matrix. I need to do procrastinate analysis, which means that I need to align all of them. I will explain that very, very fast, okay? Once I have the aligned shapes, yeah, I put them, all of them in a matrix, and I compute principal component analysis, which is just the eigendecomposition of the covariance matrix. Maybe you've worked with that already. Great. So now, when I do the eigendecompositions, I obtain the variance and the, well, the variance, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, okay? With that, I have already everything to work with a morphable model. Great. Again, the dummy setup, if you want to learn from an image, which is the 3D representation. If I work with more formal models, I don't need to predict all the shape in 3D. I can just predict the alpha, because the alpha is what is going to control everything. So all the shape is encoded in that alpha. And the loss could be something like that, mean square error of the alpha that I predicted uh, against the ground truth alpha, OK? One thing I can do that is done in literature as well is just instead of predicting the error in the alphas, since the operation to go from alpha to 3D, it's linear. I can just go to, to 3D and compute the loss in 3D directly, OK? And this is normally giving better results. So it's just a trick that you can do. Great. But this is too simple, so we are going to talk about a more fancy thing, which is using unsupervised methods to predict as well that, OK? Uh, this is the same. It's very similar to the other. But instead of using videos, they are using just images. And from images, they can learn to generate shape and pose just with images, no other thing. OK, they had 3D to generate the morphable models, but nothing else. When, well, when they train the neural net, they don't have anything else. So the key here is that, as you see, there is an encoder and a decoder, but there is a semantic ve vector, let's say, in the middle. Okay? This semantic ve vector is not when you, work as, when you work with autoencoders that there is a latent vector that maybe doesn't mean anything unless you disentang disentangle that and you enforce it to represent something. This vector is essentially the 3D shape, which are the alphas that I show you of a morphable model, are the alphas. Then I predict the albedo. The albedo is the amount of light that is reflected by a surface. Okay? So for each pixel, I have a number that say, here you reflect more, here I reflect less, nothing else. The spherical harmonics represent the illumination of the scene. You will see that we can represent that with a linear model as well. And finally, the camera pose, that is something we have already worked uh, with, which is the rotation and the translation. OK? OK. So to represent the 3D shape, they have a model as the one that I show you. But as you see, there is this green term here. And this green term is just for expressions. OK? The, the model that I showed you before, it was just the shape of the face, which is normally called identity. If you want to represent uh, expressions, which are very huge deformations, normally you model it as another term, sum, uh, summing, and with different bases. Okay, so that's why I put it in that way. But essentially, it's the same concept. For the albedo, as you see, it's the same. I have a mean, and I have some bases that are controlled by a parameter, which is this blue beta. And for the spherical harmonics, the spherical harmonics, basically, are going to give you the color at each vertex using the normals and then using the albedo that you predicted, OK? So it's like it's modeling the, how the light is interacting with your object at it's reaching your camera. It's basically that. But it's linear and it's differentiable. So you can just plug that equation in your model. And then we can predict with, uh, as we did before, from 3D we can go to 2D. So it's very simple. Now. If you see there is color, here we, have, we are able to predict color, and we are able to predict 2D positions. With that, we can generate an image, right? So from 3D, I can go to a 2D coordinate, and I know which color I need to assign there. So I can generate an image with that. OK, this is a small parenthesis as well. This is something 
that is in general called differentiable rendering. Okay? It's just to create an image from 3D and the objects, in this case lights that interact with that object. There's something very common and is uh, increasing the attention in the research community, but essentially from having a 3D object, a camera and some lights, you can render and generate an image. Okay? In the deep learning case, normally if we have an image, maybe we want to predict those objects and then to create the synthetic image with them. If I do that, then I can get the image that I had at the beginning and plug it at the end, as I did before, similarly. So it's more or less the same strategy everywhere. You will see that there are a lot of things, and recently disappeared uh, TensorFlow graphics, so you don't need to implement all these functionalities by yourself. So mo most of them are, are implemented already. Yeah, and the good thing is that this is differentiable, otherwise you could not learn. Okay, so that's the, the main point. Great, so let's, let's take a look at the laws that these people is using. So as you see, there are three terms. The first one is landmarks term. The landmarks term is just a bit of cheating that they do because they say, okay, we learn everything unsupervised. But if I have some annotations in the image, it's gonna be much better, okay? So they use that to force a bit the convergence of the algorithm when it's minimizing, okay? Since we have the 3D positions and we know the 2D positions where they are projected, I know that the point in 3D that represents my eye needs to project to the landmark in the eye, okay? So with that, I can create a loss. It's essentially that, if you take a look at the paper, you will understand that one of these terms that are here resting, one is the 2D one and the other one is the 3D one. It's uh, the 3D one projected, so it's basically this. Here, the energy of uh, photometry is just essentially resting what I have synthetically generated and the original image that I had, okay? So it's just, I have the input image, I generate something that looks more or less the same, and I compute the error. And the other one is the regularization term. Okay, when we work with morphable models, this is almost mandatory. All the time that you work with morphable models, you will need to uh, penalize if the vector, alpha, beta, or whatever vector that is in the morphable model has a big norm. Big norms means that you are going far from the mean, and since this uh, uh, kind of models assume that there is like a Gaussian representation, if you go far from the mean of a Gaussian, you are less likely to happen. So you are gonna get very weird shapes. And yeah, so we want to keep the norms of the vectors small. This is a, this is a regularization term that always appears everywhere, so. Great. And these are some results. Uh, as you can see, just learning from images without any kind of supervision, uh, unless these landmarks, they get very, very nice results. And it's something that is not, um, I mean, you, you could do it with any kind of object. Here is with faces because faces are used everywhere, but you could do that with any kind of object. If it has at least some texture that you can represent, okay? Great. Yeah? Why does this have no more Yeah. Uh, In the model, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, working with this, it's, again, kind of complex. For example, if you work just with uh, identities, you have a level of complexity. If you go with identities and expression, it's an added level of complexity. And if you add kind of teeth and so on, you need to rig them, you need to attach them to the mouth. If it's opening, the teeth maybe should open. Or it's another level of complexity. The normal uh, the work uh, that appear in research are more or less uh, st are stopping at the expressions normally. But this one is not stopping there, but it's also predicting the color, the illumination, and the camera pose. But the teeth, it's normally left apart, and the eyes as well. So they just represent more or less the skin. Okay? But yeah, it's just to, simpli to simplify things. You could do it as well. Yeah, it's just that I always see papers like this, and they always put it out, and I want to know your The teeth? The yeah, because yeah, it's something you need to rig. Otherwise, if you move this and the eye is not moving, for example, you, maybe you, the eye goes a bit out, or, and it's gonna be queer. And yeah, so it's essentially that. And so, since you can do the filters of Snapchat without that, so okay. the, commercial, the commercial part is also important, and normally they, they are not worried about that. But if you are interested on teeth especially, there are works that are focused on teeth, on modeling teeth, on doing a very good fitting on the teeth and so on. 
if if you search for it. No, if you search for it, uh, or I can show you some if you want. But there are. Great. So yeah, some observations from this work. Uh, Self-supervision, again, it's very helpful if you don't want to annotate a lot, a lot of data, or you don't want to acquire it. So it's, some, it's a, something you at least I could consider if I were starting a startup or whatever. Maybe I don't want to train everything from scratch, OK? Uh, using 3D morphological models, it's also a very, very good option when you are working on industry, because you're more or less ensure that you are going to uh, provide some results that are um, robust. Uh, you are not going to get very weird, weird shapes than if you work with other kind of representations. Because you regularize just this vector, you teach the network not to produce very uh, long vectors, and they more or less behave well. We are using that in our company with Jana, and, and it works very well. Okay? Yeah, and this is more, more or less the same that we already said. Okay, the last signal that we are going to explain today are the meshes. The meshes, it's a, a, most fle a more flexible representation, representation than the one we, we explained before. And it's very situ suitable to represent surfaces. And the characteristic is that we have some matrix that is connecting our dots. Okay? We have some lines called edges that say this point with this one goes together. And if you uh, stretch, it a lot, uh, stretch it a lot or you elongate it, uh, you are going to have some forces pulling from one and the other. Okay? So yeah, these are the uh, three elements. We have the vertex, we have the edge, and we have the triangle. Uh, we, you can work with quad meshes as well, which are meshes that work with uh, quad, let's say, with squares or rectangles instead of triangles. But triangular meshes are very common in, in computer graphics, and I decided to explain that one, OK? It's more or less the same. So yeah, meshes are not something that you natu naturally obtain uh, with a sensor and so on. You normally obtain a point cloud or a depth map or something like that. You need to post-process this information to obtain a mesh. Okay? So if you are coming from point clouds, which is the most common representation when you work with sensors, you can obtain this uh, Poisson uh, surface reconstruction, which is a very famous algorithm to go to, into a meshes. Or if you have um, how to say this, uh, voxel grids, you can also go with marching cubes. It's another algorithm. Th those are very famous. It's just for, for your information. And yeah, applications, there are a lot. Uh, especially centered in computer graphics, but uh, you could work with meshes in uh, everywhere. OK. So we are going to talk about this work, which is quite recent, uh, like the others. But anyway, uh, people was not, were not working with meshes. And since some years, uh, two or three years ago, they started. And in this one, what they do, this part is the important one. They have a mean, let's say, shape. They choose an ellipsoid, but could be anything. And they have some deformation blocks that each block deforms this ellipsoid until they reach the target shape that they want. Okay? So for that image on the top, they are going to deform the ellipsoid, and they want to, to obtain what is inside the image, the object that is inside the image. What is the branch uh, on top? The branch on top is an encoder, like the uh, standard ones, maybe BGG, ResNet, all these encoders. And what they do is to propagate the image through that encoder and extract feature maps on those intermediate layers. You know that when you propagate the image through the network, you, you're extracting some features, right? Uh, so that's what they get. And instead of computing just the encoder and at the end extracting a feature vector and from that decode, what they do is to use gradually the features since uh, you can get um, more information about maybe high frequencies and so on. Because if you use just the, the ones at the end, you are losing that information. So you want to get more local information. So this is more or less the idea. We have the image. We have an encoder. We extract some feature maps. Okay? Uh, and then, let's suppose I have a mesh. We, if we be, uh, begin with, uh, should be the ellipsoid. Okay? We have this ellipsoid. And what we want is to get features from this feature map and put it in the correct vertex, because there is a special relationship between the mesh and the image, okay? and also with the feature map. So they use also geometry for that, and use this perceptual feature pulling block. And I'm going to explain you how it works. So giving a point of the mesh, which is a 3D point, I can use the camera pose 
to project into the image plane. Okay? Since there are pooling operations, you need to do some tricks to scale that point that you reached at the beginning. But anyway, you can access to the coordinate in the future map that corresponds with that point in 3D. Okay? Yeah. So essentially, this is the vector. Uh, you should use bilinear interpolation because you never reach uh, the uh, integer, integer point. You reach a floating point, so you interpolate around the neighbors. And once you have this, you can plug it in the vertex that you were using. Okay? If we do that for each of the vertices of the 3D mesh, we end up with a mesh that at each point I have a feature vector which corresponds semantically with the shape and the image. Yeah? So then we need to process that. It's not only that I need to get information from the image, but I need to process that. In images, we work with convolutions right, to process the information. Here, we work with graph convolutions. Meshes are graphs, are some, some nodes that are interconnected, and it means that the, the nodes that are connected are more likely to share information and to have useful information to make predictions. So what they do is to use this block, OK? This block, generally speaking, is uh, there are many kinds of graph convolutions, and I don't want to explain all of them. I, I wouldn't do because it's a very complex topic. But for example, a very simple one is uh, a kind of com uh, graph convolutional networks that are called spectral graph convolutions. Uh, what they do is to use the uh, Fourier transformation, I don't know if you have heard about, probably yes, that converts the signals that are float, uh, floating on the graph into the spectral domain. Okay? And in the spectral domain, the, pro uh, the convolution becomes product. So it's much faster to compute than if we could do a convolution. Actually, it's not, at, at least I think, it's not clear enough how to do convolutions on meshes yet, because the shift operation is not well defined as, an, as in images. So they solve this by doing it on the Fourier, on the spectral domain. So this is this representation. So the convolution becomes product in the Fourier domain, and it's, it's just this. You have here two references if you want to take a look, because it's a very interesting topic. OK. So we know more or less how we extract information, how we process it, and it, now we need to understand how we penalize that when we work with meshes. So the first data terms that they talk about, and it's very common in other papers, is the chamfer loss and the normal loss. Okay? The chamfer loss is essentially penalizing the distance to the surface, to the target surface, let's say. So I'm predicting here, my surface is here, I look for the closest point, and I penalize that distance with the closest point. This is the first one. And then the normal one is just trying to find more or less the same curvature between surfaces, essentially that, OK? It's logic, actually. And then when we work with meshes, it's not as simple as when we work with 3D morphological models to penalize weird shapes, because we are working with a very high dimensional, high dimensional signal, and it's a bit more tricky. So we need to use uh, the Laplacian operator, first of all. Laplacian operator is a second order operator, which means it's related with the second derivative. And it gives you an idea of curvature as well. But this regularization is not used at the end, but is used in every deformation block. So each, def each deformation that is produced is penalized so that the curvature at the input and the curvature at the output needs to be kind of similar. Okay? This uh, prima here means that after you deform, is this, the, is this prima? And the other one is the original before the formation. Needs to be similar. So we don't get to get weird shapes in the deformation process. And then the edge length. OK, if the things are connected, if two points are connected, it's weird if I get uh, very separated points that should be, that, that are connected, actually. Normally, connected points are close to each other. So this is another thing that is, that is penalized. OK, these are some results. Uh, one of the limitations, as you see, is that if there is any hole, for example, here in, in this gun, we cannot represent it with that, at least with that mesh that they use. They use an, an ellipsoid, so you cannot make holes. That's a limitation. But there are other works that they achieve that with meshes, because they can decide also which points should not be connected. So with that, they can open and close the mesh. But OK, with, it, with this one is a limitation, but the results look, look quite nice, OK? OK, conclusions, conclusions from here. Uh, the graph convolutional thing is probably the most important. To work with meshes uh, is a trendy thing at the moment. Uh, we've been doing it, and they are kind of tricky. So it's good to work in research. I don't know if it's that good to work in the industry. 
because they are very hard to get good, uh, good results. But anyway, it's, it's something very powerful. Uh, yeah, using the residual connection, connections, I didn't explain it, but it's useful to uh, open a bit the receptive field and to reach to signals that you couldn't reach if you wouldn't use that. That resi residual connections I, and helps to propagate the, the gradients back, so it's, it makes the system more stable. And yeah, nothing else. Okay, so just to conclude, some take home messages. So yeah, using deep learning, we can generate 3D data very precisely. Uh, maybe for some problems, it's better to use geometric uh, pro approaches. But for example, if you are using an AR application, like a filter of a Snapchat, it's uh, true that deep learning methods work really, really, really well. Uh, it's super important to understand the data that we are using to use the correct representation for that problem, okay? Each data representation has a set of tools that you should use for that problem. And maybe if you mix it, uh, you're gonna be in, in trouble, okay? Then, uh, as you have seen, introducing geometry concepts, it's very useful, especially to generate uh, uh, synthetic uh, signals for supervision, but uh, as well to reduce the complexity of, of your system, because you, your system doesn't need to know that a point is projected using that equation that I show you. If you know that, that this equation is already like this, you just plug it. This is something like, uh, sometimes called inductive biases, and it's some knowledge that we already know from the world that we put exactly that way in our model, and it's, it's important to do it. Then, three more four models uh, are very robust and, and provide stable results, and then meshes allows to obtain more varying shapes, but the problem is that they are hard to deal with, and depending on the application, it's not very recommended, okay? So yeah, that's all. And if you have any question, <laughs> no? Uh, yeah, one. I don't. I don't yeah, you. Have you tried? Uh, have you worked with implicit functions? Implicit fact. Implicit functions. I haven't worked, but I have read about it. You mean, for example, a level set or something like that, or which kind of implicit yeah, functions? Meshes, yeah. This is a paper from CBPR 19. Yeah, that's something I want to try. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I haven't had time yet. But this one is, is, very, is a very awesome uh, work. I wanted to prepare it for here, actually. But the good thing is that you don't have the limitations of, for example, uh, volumetric uh, methods, that they use a lot of memory. And with that, you can represent volumes as well this with this implicit representation. And that's actually very cool. And yeah, if you are working on that, uh, yeah, I think it's, you're going to have fun because it's interesting, yeah. Uh, you were saying like, that the, maybe not, it's not the best using that much as uh, one tool, but do you know if there is any complication if you make something in a 3D like Blender, 3D Max, whatever, yeah. and then you get there the 3D image? Yeah. The, the, yeah, the, this is something, it's a good question. This is something that is very commonly done as well, to work with synthetic data. But then you have the problem of generalization. For example, you can render, uh, for example, imagine I have a 3D of your face, and I can render a RGB image, and I can render with Blender like the depth map, okay? With that, I can train my neural network to go from uh, uh, rendered RGB to rendered depth map. But then the problem that I have is the distribution gap. And it's uh, something that is happening for autonomous driving a lot. Uh, people is training their models on uh, simulated scenarios, and then when they put the car on the street, uh, it's not working because there is the, the network is very sensitive to the changes uh, to the distribution of the input data. So there's something you can do. What you cannot do, for example, is uh, you have your RGB image of your model, for example, and then you produce with Blender somewhere in the middle a depth map because you will not be able to by propagate because Blender is not differentiable. So you need to make all the steps differentiable to generate your supervising, unless you use reinforcement learning, but that's something else. Yeah, but, but you can use it with Blender if you want to test an algorithm. Maybe instead of annotating data or making a very complex loss, it's nice that you take a, a synthetic data, but RGB and dev, and you train your model. And you can try the things there, you can, because you have perfect ground truth, so. Is something useful. Anyone else? Great, so thank you.